there. We're at Red Rocks for our nine adventure special. It's not a bad place to start the work day. It's better than the side of the road during a snowstorm. Or inside a courtroom. Or inside your news vehicle full of banana peels and garbage. Knock it off. Anyway, I'm Ann Herbst. And I'm Noel Brennan. Our photojournalists and reporters have traveled all over Colorado to show you some really beautiful places. And to introduce you to some really cool people like a scientist Katie Eastman and I met this summer. Their language is quick, chirps matching the speed of their wings. I, I have jitter leg, I can't sit still. I, uh, and Nicholas Alexander caffeinates to keep up. I come up here with my ice latte every day. It's usually my second one too. <laughs> it helps him speak their language as the birds and him work through the rain. We talk to them all the time. Um, say, hey, how are you doing? Um, are you thirsty? Do you want a drink? But his translations can be complicated. Um, something I like to talk about is called pleiotropy. That's something called standing variation. There is likely niche partitioning. Nicholas speaks science. They're so cute, yeah. Sometimes. His official title is geneticist. This is another juvenile female. This little dude is from, coming back from Alaska, so it's one of the longest migrations of any bird for its size. He looks at the variation of bill size in hummingbirds at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab in Gothic. Currently, I am photographing the bill. He's found even birds within the same species have all different shapes and sizes. Um, I put that in a tube for sequencing later. Nicholas wants to know what genes explain the differences. Making generalizations about species, uh, it ignores a lot of the really complex dynamics that are happening within that species. His unofficial title is a little more <laughs> relatable. We are called the Humming Nerds, and we have t-shirts. So if you want one, email me. A title earned after sequencing 500 hummingbird genomes with some help from David Inouye, another hummingbird expert at the lab. Hummingbirds actually have one of the highest rates of evolution of any bird species. That's the serious science stuff. Yeah, this is our my 49th year coming out here. And at this shack, the silly, it's never far behind. 48. Just kidding. Um, this is my seventh year out here. The research here goes beyond birds and will answer unknown questions about evolution in the wild. Oh yeah, it's always so much fun. But getting to hold these tiny creatures. Right into the bushes. And becoming <laughs> more like them. I got a broad-tailed hummingbird um, and an and a Indian paintbrush. It makes the science tangible. Yeah, and they're cute. A translation anyone can understand. You should belong to that group. Why? I don't know anything about birds. And because of the nerd part. Oh, this back and forth is pretty typical. It happened a lot during that story in Glenwood Canyon when you told me a hike we were going to do was going to be cake. I got injured. You got yelled at. A lot by you. And we both got beers afterwards. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> yeah. Friendship follows the tracks in Glenwood Canyon. Step by step, this group Dude, of... Dude, we talked about this over beers last week. That's not how we agreed to start the story. You don't want to do it? <laughs> oh, that's right. We wanted to start at the end. Yeah, where I'm clinging to that rock right there. And I'm standing on top of it. Shut up. I can say that because we're friends. Anyway, that's us with two guys we just met. Steve Kibler. Steven, S-T-E-V-E-N. And Mike Paddock. It's actually Michael. And this we'll get to later. Okay, now we can talk about how we got here. You're getting more exercise than we are. Getting an opening shot is hard work. I think I got it. One that captures four friends beginning an adventure. It's getting there. Two of them. Not sure where there is, but it's getting there. Know the route like it's their backyard. <laughs> it's, it's almost like going home anymore. Mike is usually the guy in the lead. Going very good. Nice day for it. Steve is the one soaking it in. The feel of the rock and the smell of the lichen, it couldn't be better. Couldn't be better. Mike's daughter and their friend Josh tag along. Uh -huh. Steve and Mike go way back. How far back? Far enough that we have to use one of these. The pair started hanging out in the 60s. One thing led to another, and being crazy as we are, it, everything clicked. 19-year-olds who loved climbing. The tougher, the better. Things haven't changed. 
Right before the Vietnam War came calling, they had an idea. I was one week from the Air Force. He was two weeks from the Army. So we decided to do something crazy. Said we ought to leave something to remember us by, just for fun. So 13th of March, 1968, we Put a flag up. Up, as in way up there, <sighs> on the cliffs of Glenwood Canyon. Okay. And that's why we're hauling camera equipment through this jungle. And why are there so many loose rocks? Know what? Rocks hurt. Just listen and look at this angry picture. Oh, whoa! Oh, God. This is nuts. <laughs> of course. Why do you think 19-year-olds do it? The same reason 71-year-olds <laughs> keep doing it. It just became something that we did. Then the next year, well, we did it last year. We better do it again. Pretty soon, it's 50 years. <laughs> we have hundreds of people that have said, I make my kids look for it every year. Every time we go through the canyon, they have to look for it. This edge has got a lot of good handholds. As age creeps up and aches sink in. Yeah, I've got a knee and a hip and a shoulder replaced. They know this can't last forever. I, I will regret not being able to do it at some point in my life. That's where that Josh dude from the beginning comes in. Okay. okay. The guy holding our camera down there. We were two, we're now three. And now he's just one of us. He's, he's the third wheel. Not as old, but just as nuts. <laughs> uh, you know, if they're nuts, then I'm nuts. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so. More than 100 people have been talked into taking this trip. The flag is a tool to friendship. Friendship is a tool to the flag. Everybody that's come up here, I claim, is a friend. And we better be included, because that was the scariest shoot I've been on. Should I tell my wife how small this ledge was? You know, in truth, I am absolutely tickled pink that the two of you came along. <laughs> you know, as long as I can get up there and back down, uh, yeah, we'll keep doing it. That's where the story ends, for now. It's where it started, too. I definitely want to get a picture of everybody. Two old friends will keep doing what they've always done. And are you coming or no? Friends like us are lucky. Lucky? Yeah, lucky. To help keep a flag flying for 51 years and counting. Next, we're heading up to Wyoming, where a park ranger had a pretty memorable day at work. We get to travel all over to tell these awesome stories. Like, Ann, you got to go to Wyoming to tell this next one. Yeah, the Grand Teton National Park, a great place to hike, paddle, and get engaged. You can't go anywhere in this park and not see something. This is in your face beauty. So many memories are made in our national parks. Well, welcome to Teton. I'm glad you made it. And the people who work in them know that. <laughs> Brian Appleby yeah. is one of those workers. Do you have any plans on what you might want to do here in the park? Brian's an interpretive ranger at Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. Go forth and adventure. He knows his way around this joint. The permit for the park is there. He's been coming here since 1972. It's not that unusual to encounter a bear on the trail. They, they like using the same trails we do. Helping people enjoy nature with humor. That's Brian's M.O. The show tunes from the early 60s television shows repels bears. It's not my voice, it's a song selection. In a past life, Brian helped people in a totally different way. I don't get usually rattled. In Colorado no. as a state trooper. Even when I've been shot at, yeah. He'll need that solid as a rock demeanor to make his own memories tonight. Susie is a young lady that I first met over 35 years ago. He was a trooper and I was a records technician. I like the fact that we have history and, and I don't have to explain myself. <laughs> Susie is the understanding girlfriend. And during Brian's popular ranger talk about bears, grizzly bears, he's going to end his 18 year stint as a bachelor and propose, but he won't say that. Uh, I keep reminding her, I says, 
uh, I think you're going to find out how amazing I really am. <laughs> yeah, he's, he, yeah, he says he says stuff like that, so I'm I'm ready to be impressed. <laughs> I'm Ranger Brian, and we're about to embark on an adventure tonight. As the mood lighting gets a little more appropriate for a talk about bears and a proposal. Where are you from? People settle in. You guys? Colorado. Col whereabouts? Conifer. Oh, excellent! I used to do some undercover work up there in, in Aspen Park. <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember you. <laughs> I like that he loves this stuff, and he, he loves it so much, and he's so good at it. Are you like a clan? Yes. Motorcycle gang? Oh. <laughs> he is a rock star. Don't tell him that. <laughs> We're here tonight to talk about grizzlies. A talk about grizzly bears might not seem like the best time for romance. And the bear came. But Brian loves this park. See where we're going here? Loves Susie even more. I wanted to do something for some family and friends that are, that are here tonight. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about, so Susie Matthews. Yep. Uh, Not all memories that's... in national parks conjure up jagged mountains or interesting wildlife. You're going to have to help me here. So, Susie Matthews, if you would, if, if anybody can still hear me, uh, here we go. You know how, how hard this is. Let's see, which, which knee? Ah. <laughs> Some memories are made with just a four-word question. Would you marry me? With a simple one-word answer. Uh, yes, <laughs> I will marry you. Okay. <laughs> For a guy who's spent so much time helping visitors create memories at Grand Teton, the fit? this yeah, it is huh. his time. Do you want me to you want to leave it with me? No. <laughs> to create a lasting one of his own. That was a good surprise, thank you. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna say? I am amazing. You are amazing. <laughs> How did you propose to your wife, Noel? Was it romantic? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. while she continues to make a fool of herself, we'll head up to El Dorado Canyon where Lori Lizarraga and Brian Wenlin show us how trails are made. Way up in the trails of El Dorado Canyon State Park. Sculpting rocks make me really happy, so I smile and then I catch chips of rock in my teeth. <laughs> Mike McHugh and a small team in hard hats are hard at work. They're a trail crew. That's probably good, Maggie. And they see the path to the next adventure before anyone even knows it's there. If we do this right, this is work that'll last 100 years. Mike started climbing El Dorado Canyon 13 years ago. Just from hiking and climbing and talking to people, I could see that the climbing access trails needed some help. He started building stairs for everyone else to climb El Dorado Canyon pretty soon after that. That's probably good enough. He's an amazing teacher. Um, yeah, already in the week that I've been here, I've already learned so much. I don't know about wisdom, but I can show people how to put rocks on rocks. <laughs> He's modest, but this state park wouldn't work without him and his team. Right now, they're building steps that will make it safer for thousands of climbers on this side of the park. Obviously, a big part of our job up here is moving rocks from one place to another and not getting injured doing that. Yeah, just a bit more and then we can lower it down. Every move is strategic. It's getting there. It's a game of inches. We'll probably place two more steps today. But they take pride in this work. We're going Monday through Thursday, so we will all be up here. So four days a week, 10 hours a day, <laughs> Mike and the crew will be on the side of this mountain, paving the way to the top. That looks like hard work. Not as hard as working with you. Ow. Next, we'll head south where aliens built these things. Dude, not aliens. These are part of Colorado's mining history. Thanks for sticking with us, and especially for sticking with Noel because he's such a dork. Our next adventure takes us to Cokedale, Colorado, where photojournalist Mike Grady discovered part of Colorado's mining history. It's a secluded area that allows people to, to enjoy the quiet. 
decorated by remnants of the mining industry that once occurred here over 100 years ago. You see the coke ovens here that look like Roman aqueducts and they have a rich story. That story would often be lost if it wasn't for the preservation efforts of people who thought that that mining mattered in the first place. People like Mr. Dave Harris over here. How already? Showtime, folks. Who spends his time uh, volunteering in this community. This gentleman over here is a, a new friend, and his name is Don. I'm Don Unger. I'm the membership development coordinator at the Western Museum of Mining and Industry. You're in the town of Cokedale. And Cokedale started off in 1899. And the American Smelting and Refining Company owned the Cokedale town proper site. Cokedale in Los Animas County contained the largest deposits of bituminous coal, metallurgical coal, west of the Mississippi, so it, it was very important. Well, I think as the name of the town belies, the coking of coal was at the center of the economy here in Cokedale. The process of coke taking that metallurgical coal and getting rid of the impurities that are inside of it. Well, these are called beehive ovens, and there were different types of ovens, but these they found to be the most efficient for making coke. They'd be loaded from the top with either six to eight tons of coal. They'd be sealed up in the front and on the roof, and a fire would be started in the room below that oven. And then people called cokers reach in there and drag that hot coal out, rake it into railroad cars, gondolas, and then those gondolas would then go to El Paso, Texas to make steel. And to smelt down different metals that were used in industrial processes as well as in defense processes for the U.S. military. And the miners were paid 58 cents per ton for their loads of coal. Very tough, very tough. There were actually 25 fatalities here just in Cokedale. Uh, times were hard and they needed work. The way they had it, this was going to be the ideal coal camp of the 20th century. And at the height of production in this town, there were 1,500 people here, miners that were working, and that includes their families as well. Instead of being a tent colony, what they did is they began actually building structures. They built a school. They had six teachers. It went from kindergarten to eighth grade. Baseball was a big thing for coal camps. You worked six days a week, and Sunday was your day off, but that's that's when you were on the diamond. That's when you played ball. They had uh, Carbon Hall, which was their dance hall, and liquor store, and party store. People had a great time here, even though they were working for pennies. But if you talk to old timers, they say it was the greatest time of their life. It's one of the few coal camps that's still pretty much intact. Most of the other camps, you'd never know they were there. They're gone. These are still around, and the only reason is is because it became a historic district. People stayed here, and they, they didn't let them be destroyed. The clock of history doesn't stop when the extraction stops. In fact, the history of the land and the people have continued here in Cokedale, and this is one fine example of why it is that we need to pay attention to the whole history of mining here in Colorado. We're almost done! Let's go to Estes Park for this one. Mark Salinger and I discovered when the elk are rocking, the tourists come and knocking. High up in the mountains, there's a guy looking for love. They're looking for their ladies. No, no, not that guy. This guy, the one with the toned body and irresistible way with words. Tonight's eligible bachelor. You know, the one all the girls are chasing after. It seems kind of greedy to me to have that many. <laughs> They need a share. <laughs> his brain's saying no, his instinct and his hormones are saying go. <laughs> He's got it and he flaunts it. Seriously, you guys, look at his rack. And tonight, I mean, it's huge. He's got a lot of choices for his final rose. Things get and people interesting <laughs> are into it. It's like Bachelor in Paradise. They do their thing. Nobody's going to steal his stud rates, you know. Our bachelor loves lawn walks through meadows. Romantic dinners with a view. <laughs> Looks like he does. And making babies, as many as possible. I mean, it's better at night, you know. I mean, it's uh, more romantic, and we've got about a half moon tonight. The contestants on Nature's version of The Bachelor? That is a harem of females, um, which is the elk term for like 
the group of females that males will congregate and mate with throughout the rut. So this is when the bucks go out and try to build their harem for reproduction, the strongest survive. And then they'll use the rack not only to attract females, but to fight with the other males. As the saying goes, all is fair in love and war. Well, I don't understand why he doesn't make a up. And our protagonist has a villain. So why does he have the harem yeah, and he has none? Yeah, I was ask that. The competitor's eyes are set on the girls, any of them, all of them. Or maybe he's been whispering things in their ear, like, you know the little curve in the river down here? <laughs> meet me there and, and I'll be bugling. Elk versus elk. So is he talking to him or is he talking to all the females? A battle for the females, a battle for love, sort of. You wonder if there's any uh, romance involved. You know, you kind of you kind of hope there is that he's maybe he's picked out a favorite. With the world watching the most dramatic finale of the season, <laughs> they all wonder. Will she invite him to spend the night? You can see the, the burden that's on him right now. Depends on if he ends the evening on the right note. Don't you just love a good rom-com? Those are Noel's favorite movies. Okay, let's wrap this up. Thanks for joining us in our Night Adventures special. And don't worry, we really don't fight this much. Eh, we kind of do. Anyway, keep adventuring. Is that a word? No, it's not, but I like it. So keep adventuring it is. <laughs>